Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is 11th of April 2021. And today we are studying the physics 5054. It's school hours physics. And today we have set our hearts to solve uh, MCQ paper. Today we are solving May, June 2011. And uh, it's, uh, we call it paper one. And um, this is from the zone one. So let's start this paper and hopefully you will uh, enjoy this. So let's start. So this is the May, June 2011, one one paper on your screen and let's start. Okay, so the first question is coming. Okay. A plumber measures as accurately as uh, possible the length and internal diameter of a straight copper pipe. The length is approximately 80 centimeter and the internal diameter is approximately two centimeter. What is the best combination of instruments for the plumber to use? You see, uh, for internal diameter, we always use uh, um, a vernier caliper because the vernier calipers have internal jaws with, the, with which we can measure the internal diameter of something. So for internal diameter, we can use the vernier caliper and the length is 80 centimeter. So you can use rule, uh, tape is used for something which is more than one meter. So the rule and the vernier caliper, vernier caliper and the rule. So I think C is the choice. Yep, C is the right choice. So we have C is the right choice, question number one. Question number two, and let me, uh, okay, so question number two, what is the correct unit for the quantity shown? Electromotive force is correct unit is volt. Latent heat is measured in joules, so B is the right choice. Pressure is measured in Newton per meter square. Weight is measured in Newtons. So B is the right choice. Question number two, B is the right choice. Okay, so let's move to the next part. Question number three, a skydiver falls from rest through the air and reaches the terminal velocity. What is the acceleration of the sky diver during this fall? You see, when you start falling, your acceleration will be 10. And gradually the acceleration will decrease as the air resistance will increase, the uh, resultant force will gradually decrease and the acceleration value will also decrease. At some point, what will happen that the, and that the air resistance and the weight, they both will be equal to each other. When they both will be equal to each other, the resultant force will become zero and the acceleration will also become zero. So the acceleration will start from 10 and it will gradually decrease to zero. So question number three, D is the right choice starting at 10 meter per second square and decreasing to zero meter per second square. So question number three, D is the choice. So we have this question, question number, uh, this is the question number. Okay, so a car accelerates from traffic lights for 10 seconds. <clears throat> it accelerates for 10 seconds. And it stays a steady speed for 20 seconds. For 20 seconds, the car remained at a steady speed and then breaks to a stop in three seconds. In three seconds, the, the car stopped. So first it accelerated in the speed time graph. The acceleration is shown. Uh, with an inclined line. We don't know whether it's uh, accelerated uniformly or non-uniformly. But one thing which we know is that the car uh, was, uh, car moved at a steady speed for 20 seconds. So the graph should remain uh, flat for 20 seconds. So this graph remained flat for not more, this is not 20 seconds. This graph remains steady from 10 to 30. So it remains to, it moved with a steady speed of uh, for 20 seconds. And this 
also has a steady speed, but it is not for 20 seconds. It, it, it remains steady from 10 to 20. Only for 10 seconds, it's moving with the steady speed. And this one has never been moving with the steady speed. So I am looking for that graph in which the, 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 the vehicle, the car traveled for 20 seconds with the same speed. For 20 seconds, the graph should remain flat. So clearly the B is the choice for question number four. B is the choice you can see it remains steady for 20 seconds. So uh, let's move to the next part and it says, the next part is uh, which, uh, it says which vehicle has an acceleration of five meter per second square. So up here, a bicycle when its speed changes from rest to 2.5 meter per second. In two seconds, you see the initial speed is zero. The final speed is 2.5 meter per second. And this happened in two seconds. So I can find out the acceleration. Let me show you my work. I've done this on a paper let me show you. So, okay. So here we go. And question number five, you can see the formula for the acceleration is A is equal to V minus U divided by T. For the first body, I can calculate the acceleration. Its final speed is 2.5. The initial speed is zero. So it will be 2.5 minus zero divided by two. And the acceleration will be 1.25 meter per second square. For the second body, the final speed is 15. The initial speed is zero. And the time taken for this change is five seconds. So 15 minus zero divided by five. Answer will be three meter per second square. A 320 minus 0 divided by 15. 20 is the final speed. Initial speed is 0. The time taken is 15. So I will apply the formula. And the value is 1.33 meter per second square. And the fourth, the fourth for, for the fourth body, it will be 50 minus 0 divided by 10. Initial speed is 0. Final speed is 50. Time taken is 10. So apply this formula. The acceleration will be 5 meter per second square. Their question was, which object has the greatest acceleration? So clearly the fourth one, so the option is D. Question number uh, for the question uh, number five, the option is D, let's check. Let's check question number. So this is the choice. Question number D is the choice. So a car moves in a circle at a constant speed. What is the direction of the resultant force acting on the car? This is the center of that circle in which the car is moving. So we know that whenever a body moves in a circle, the direction of the resultant force is always towards the center of the circle. So the resultant force, which arrow is pointing towards the center of circle? Clearly, that is B. So B is the choice for question number six. B is the choice, sir. So next question on your screen is uh, question number uh, seven. A student collects stones and finds their density. What, which apparatus is needed to measure the mass and the volume of the stones? The mass of the stone you can measure by the top pen balance. And for, for measuring the volume, you remember that uh, measuring, we can use the measuring cylinder. You pour some water in it and you note down the volume, then you pour, then you put the stones in it, and then you note down the volume, and from V2 minus V1, do this calculation, you get the volume of the stones, and then you can find the density of the stones by dividing with the mass with the volume of the stones. So the two instruments which you will be using will be the top pan balance and the mining cylinder and water. So clearly the C is the choice. C is the right choice. Question number seven, C is the right choice. <clears throat> Question number, okay. So here we have a uniform beam is balanced at its midpoint. A wave object is placed on the beam as shown. So the uh, pivot is under the center of gravity. It's in the center. And here we have an object whose weight is 60 Newton and its, its distance from the pivot is 30 centimeter. Its distance, from the, its distance from the pivot is 30 centimeter. 
So it is trying to produce an anti-clockwise turning effect. I can find out that turning effect. 60 Newton multiplied 30 centimeter. It will be something like 1800 Newton centimeter anti-clockwise. Which force will rebalance the beam? So I will be looking for that force from the given four options, which will be producing 1800 Newton centimeter moment uh, in a clockwise manner. So let's check them. I have done that. So for example, 30 Newton acting towards upwards, 60 centimeter to the left of the midpoint. So this a force of, uh, I've done this on a paper. Let me show you from, from there. Okay, so here, you know, um, the clockwise moment is 30 into 60 equals to 1800. And they said that I, we have a 30 Newton force, which is 60 centimeter uh, on the, from the pivot on the, on the left side, and it is acting upward. So it will try to produce a uh, uh, clockwise uh, moment. And that clockwise moment will be 30 into 60 into 1800. So clearly this will balance it because the anti-clockwise moment is 1800, clockwise moment is 1800. So the answer should be A. But for your understanding, let's check the other ones also. Here he said a force which is acting on the right side in the upward direction and 60 centimeter from the pivot. You see the clockwise. This is trying to produce an anti-clockwise moment. This is also trying to produce an anti-clockwise moment. So the clockwise moment here, no, nothing is trying to produce a clockwise moment here. So the clockwise moment will be zero. Anti-clockwise moment will be a moment produced by this 60 Newton force and the moment plus the moment produced by this 30 Newton force. That will be 60 into 30 plus 60 into 30 and that will be 3600. So uh, this uh, in this B option, the things will be not balanced because both the forces are trying to produce an anti-clockwise moment. In this diagram, you can see this is the original one. And he said the force of 40, 45 Newton, which is, uh, I, I, by mistake, I wrote here meter, 45 Newton. And it is 45 centimeter from the pivot. So this force will be trying to produce an anti-clockwise moment. This will be trying to produce a clockwise moment. Let's count them. 16 to 30, 1800 Newton centimeter anti-clockwise moment and the clockwise moment will be 45 into 45, 2025 Newton centimeter. But you see their value, their magnitude is not equal to each other. So they will not balance each other. In the last option, he said a force of 90 Newton, which is, two, uh, which is acting on the left side and is 20 centimeter and is acting downward. Yeah, from the pivot, it's on the right, uh, on the left side. So this force, 90 Newton, will be also producing an anti-clockwise moment. The 60 Newton force is also producing an anti-clockwise moment. So uh, you know that 60 into 30, it will be 1800 plus uh, 90 to 20, 1800, 3600. And the clockwise moment is zero. So the anti-clockwise and the clockwise moment, they are not equal to each other. That's why this thing will not balance. So only the first option, A option, in that option, the anti-clockwise moment and the clockwise moment, they were equal to each other. So uh, their question was, in which situation the thing will be balanced? So clearly, A is the right option. For question number eight, for question number eight, A is the right option. It's not visible, the whole question. Okay, now no, you can see the whole thing. A student finds the center of mass of a triangular lamina PQR. He drills a small hole at the Q. He suspends the lamina from a pin through the hole at Q so that the lamina swings freely. He, de he then hangs the plumb line from the pin at Q as shown, he marks the position of the plumb line on the lamina. To determine the location of the center of the ma of mass, the student then repeats the experiment, but with one change. What is that change? 
So now he has to, I think, um, hang it with from R or if he should hang it from P. He suspends the lamina from the hole at the Q with R on the left and P on the right. Do you understand what this means? If the lamina was hung from here, it was hung from here, then he's say, saying hang it like this. It will be of no use. You get the same line which you have already drawn uh, along the plumb line. So the A is not the answer. He suspend the lamina from a pin through a hole at R. That can be the answer. He uses a heavier weight on the plumb. It does not matter. He uses a longer plumb line. It does not matter. So the best option will be he should be have a hole here and then he suspends the lamina from this hole and then he will be able to get two lines which where they will intersect, you will find the center of the mass. So the B looks the uh, best option, sir. B is the best option for question number nine. Yeah, B is the option. So, So we have this question and the same downward force is applied to four objects resting on a horizontal surface, which exerts the greatest pressure on the surface. You see the force in all the four cases is the same thing. And you know, the pressure is of course divided by area. So wherever the area will be the smallest, the, the pressure will be the greatest. So the smallest contact area, I think is the drawing pin have with the, with table. So I think B is the right answer. Very easy question. Four identical mining cylinders contain liquid, two contain water of density 1000 kg per meter cube, two contains paraffin of density 800, 800 kg per meter cube. Which cylinder has the least which cylinder has the least pressure exerted on its base by the liquid it contains. So we are looking for, what we are looking for the least pressure. We are looking for the least pressure. So the least pressure will be there where the density is lowest and the height of the, what, the, height of the liquid is also lower. So the density lowest will be for the paraffin and the lowest height is 40. So clearly D is the choice. The pressure should be least and least pressure is where you have the lowest density and the smallest height. And that is paraffin in the D where the height of the paraffin is only 40. So D is the choice, question number 11. I think question number 11, D is the right choice. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Here we have, he says, uh, Here we go. The diagram represents parts of a power station, coal-fired boiler, turbine, electricity, and generator. What is the order of the energy changes taking place in the coal-fired boiler? The coal is burnt. If the coal has chemical potential energy, and that is converted into heat. And that heat is then uh, we use to boil the boil the water and the steam is produced so that heat is converted into the steam is steams come out of the jets and uh, so what happened that steam then rotate the blades of the turbine and that turbine rotates the shaft of the electricity and the generator and the generator produces electricity so you see um, at the start you will have the chemical potential energy in the coal and then it will burn and that gives you of you the heat and that by that heat you um, steam, you produce steam of the water, and that has kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy, then with the help of the generator we create the electric energy. So the very good uh, order I think is A, a chemical. Let's check B also. Chemical kinetic no. From chemical first heat comes out. Heat and chemical that's wrong. Kinetic chemical that is also wrong. So only the E is a sensible order of energies, which is 
convergent energy forms, which at first we have, and then the next, then the next. So A is the right choice. Question number 12, A is clearly the right choice. He says the center of the sun produces large amount of energy. What is the source of this energy on the sun? You know, the center of the sun produces large amount of energy. What is the source of energy? On the sun, you know, on the sun, we have... Uh, hydrogen and hydrogen hydrogen small atoms they come joined together by the process of fusion the nucleus of hydrogen and hydrogen join and make a larger nucleus we call it helium and this process gives out a lot of lot of lot of energy and you know and this process is called nuclear fusion and this is taking place on the sun so the source of energy on the sun is nuclear fusion so clearly C is the choice. Question number 13, C is the right choice. The process of nuclear fusion is taking place on the sun and that is the source of energy for the sun. A crane lifts a weight of 1,000 Newton through a vertical height of 30 meter. It uses 60,000 60, uh, joules of energy. So what is the efficiency of the crane? So I can find out the efficiency. The efficiency is equal to useful output energy or the useful work done by and uh, divided by the total input energy multiplied by 100. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. And here we go. Okay. So useful output energy is equals to the weight multiplied by the vertical height. The weight is 1000 Newton and the vertical height is 30 meter. So it will be 30,000 joules. Input energy is 60,000 joules. So the efficiency is useful output energy divided by total input energy multiply 100. So it will be 30,000 divided by 60,000 multiply 100 and the efficiency will be 50%. Efficiency will be 50%. Question number 14, C is the right choice. Let's check. 50% is the answer. C is the right choice. Question number 14. C is the right. C is the right choice. Okay. So uh, now we have uh, according according to the kinetic uh, according to the kinetic theory, matter is made up of very small particles in a Let me check this side. It seems something is wrong. According to the kinetic theory, matter is made up of very small particles in a constant state of motion. Which row best describes the particle behavior in the liquid state? So in the liquid state, the forces between the particles is strong and the motion of the particles, they move randomly at uh, vibrate about their move randomly at high speed. Why they don't move at high speed, they randomly move, yeah, that's true. Move randomly at high speed, vibrate to and fro around a fixed position, vibrate but are free to move positions. So question number 15, the intermolecular forces should be strong and, but, you know, the intermolecular forces are strong, but uh, the particles are free to move position. They are not moving at a very high speed. Vibrate, but are free to move position. Yeah, B can be the right answer. 
it's a very tricky question you know it's not easy to answer this one because uh, you know these are quite confusing okay so let's move to the next part so the b question number 15 b is the right choice okay a balloon filled with air is gently heated a balloon filled with air is gently heated what happens to the mass and to the and the density of the air inside the balloon so uh you are heating it so what will happen to the mass you see when you heat the nothing will happen to the mass you see the by heating the mass cannot be changed and what density uh when you heat it the mass remains constant but the volume increases and you know the density is equal to mass divided by volume so if the mass is uh, same and the volume has increased so the density is mass divided by volume so the numerator has uh, sorry the denominator has increased the numerator is constant so the density value will decrease mass stays the same and the density value will decrease so i think c is the right choice question number 16 c is the right choice A certain liquid is used in a liquid in glass thermometer. It does not expand uniformly with temperature. What effect this will have on the scale of the thermometer? You see, if it's not expanding uniformly, then the scale of the, of the thermometer will be not linear. Very simple uh, concept-based question. If the liquid is not expanding uniformly, then the scale will be non-linear. So question number 17, A is the choice. Question number next is 18. An ice pack is used to cool 0.25 kg of water. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 kilojoules per kg per degree centigrade. How much thermal energy heat must the ice pack extract from uh, the water to reduce the water temperature by 15 degrees centigrade. You see here, uh, temperature change in, is involved. Whenever a temperature change is involved, the heat, I can calculate very simple formula. Heat is equal to MC delta theta. So MC delta theta and M stands for the mass, C stands for the specific heat capacity, and delta theta is the change in the temperature. So I have done this numerical. Let me show you my work and let's see what happens. Okay. So the formula for heat is MC delta theta. The mass is 0 0.25 kg. The C value specific heat capacity is 4.2 X per three. And the change in the temperature is 15 degrees centigrade. So just multiply them and your final answer will be uh one one 5.75 x per three joules 10 raised by three joules means uh, kilojoules so it will be 15.75 kilojoules and if you round it off it will be like 16 kilojoules question number 18 i think c will be the choice 16 kilojoules question number 18 16 kilojoules and c is the choice Fillings in teeth should be made from a material which does not expand when heated. No, no, that's right. That's wrong. The filling should expand. Expands by the same amount as the tooth uh, when heated. You know, that is right. The expansion in that filling and the expansion of the teeth should be equal to each other. Contraction and expansion, they should have the same contraction, same expansion expansion then they will uh, the filling will remain there otherwise if the teeth is not expanding or contracting and the filling is expanding or contracting the cracks will develop in the filling and it will come out so it should expand by the same amount as the tooth when heated so b looks the right answer uh, expand is less than the tooth when heated that's wrong that is not a good idea Expands more than the tooth when eating, that is also not right idea. 
it should expand as much as the tooth is expanding or it should contract as much as the tooth is uh, contracting. So then the filling will remain there. So B choice. Question number 19, B is the right choice. Okay. So on your screen, we have question number 20, the displacement distance and displacement time graphs are for a water wave in a ripple tank. What is the speed of the water wave? So if you look at these graphs carefully, there are two graphs. The first graph is a displacement distance graph. From the displacement distance graph, I can tell the wavelength of the wave. From the displacement distance graph, I can tell the wavelength of the wave, lambda. So from this graph, you see the, well, the complete wave took two centimeters. So the length, wavelength, lambda value is two centimeters. From this second graph, which is a displacement time graph, I can tell the time period. And then from the time period, I can, I can calculate the frequency. So for one complete wave, you see it took 0 0.04 seconds. So it means the time period is 0 0.04 seconds. Once I know the time period, I can find the frequency. The frequency is equals to one by T. So once you know the frequency, you know the wavelength, you can apply the formula V is equals to F lambda. And then easily you can find, I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. From the first graph, we came to know that the wavelength is two centimeters. From the second graph, I came to know that the time period is 0 0.04 seconds. So from this time period, I can find out the frequency. F is equals to one by T, one by 0 0.04, and F will be 25 Hertz. If you enter this in your calculator, one divided by 0 0.04 equals to, it will be 25 Hertz. So once you know the wavelength and the frequency very easily, you can find the speed V is equals to F lambda, F is 25, lambda is two. So 25 multiplied two, that will be 50 centimeter per second. So the speed of the wave will be 50 centimeter per second. Let's check the answers, 50 centimeter per second. And clearly the D is the choice. Ma'am, clearly the D is the right choice. Question number 20, D is the right choice. Here we go, we have the next question and it says, okay, so we have question number 21 is on your screen. A ray of light strikes a plane mirror and is reflected. Which pair of angle must be equal in value whenever reflection takes place? The angle of incidence and angle of reflection, they are equal to each other. So angle of incidence here is X and angle of reflection here is Y. So the angle X and the angle Y, they should be equals to each other. Which pair of angles must be equal in value? C is the right choice, angle X and angle Y, which are the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection here, they should be equal to each other. So C is the choice. In which diagram is the path of the light ray not correct? You see, let's check. We are looking for where the ray is not correct. The light ray is not correct, okay? So here you see the light is traveling in the water and it came out. When it, it came out, if I draw a normal here, it should bend away from the normal and it did. So there's no problem with the figure A. Figure B, you see this light is entering into, into the glass slab and it's making 90 degree angle with the surface of the glass. So it should not bend, it, its, it's path should not change. It should go undeviated into the glass and it did. And here, I, if you draw normal, the angle of incidence and angle of reflection, they both will be equal to each other. So here the total internal reflection has taken place, okay. Here when the light is emerging, it's making 90 degree angle with the surface of the glass. So no path change will take place. So B has no problem. Let me uh, come to the diagram C. The light is entering into the perspex by making a 90 degree angle with the surface of the perspex. So there will be no uh, deflection. There will be no uh, refraction. The light will enter into the second medium without any cha change in the direction. 
so here the light on this point the light is coming out of this glass into the air if i will draw a normal here you can see if i draw a normal with the surface of the glass here you will see that the light has bended away from the normal which is the right thing no, no problem with this diagram this diagram d you see the light is entering into this glass and it's making 90 degree angle with the surface of the glass when the light enters into a glass and makes 90 degree angle with the surface of the glass there should be no deflection the path of the light should not change whenever the light enters into a second medium by making a 90 degree angle with the surface of that medium the path of the light should not change but here you see when the light was making 90 degree angle with the surface of the glass but when it entered into the glass they have shown that it has changed the direction that is wrong so we were looking a diagram where the answer is the ray the light ray is not uh, going correct so d is the right choice question number 22 d is the right choice uh the ray diagram shows two rays from a point on an object placed in front of a diverging concave lens so it's a diverging lens and what are the properties of the image produced the image produced will be here you see the image produced will be here the image produced will be here you see the image will be here this image will be uh virtual this image will be upright and this image will be diminished this image will be smaller than the object so what are the properties of the image produced this image will be virtual and it will be smaller than the object so i think d is the right choice you see the object is larger and the image formed here will be smaller this image is virtual this image is upright this image is smaller than the object So that was question number twenty-three. B is the right choice. Let's move to the next part. <clears throat> Which application may use the part of the electromagnetic spectrum called microwaves? So microwaves are used in cooking vegetables. Yes, we have used the microwaves in microwave oven. and so they are used for cooking vegetable detecting small cracks in the metals no we don't use microwaves for this purpose gaining a small sun tan uv light is used for this purpose and lighting a fluorescent tube a uv light is used in that case also so question number 24 clearly only a is the choice the microwaves are used for cooking vegetables question number 24 a is the right choice So next question is sound travels at different speeds in air water and steel how for these but here is which row is correct sound travels slowest in the air the sound travels slowest in the air the sound travels fastest in the solid that is steel so a is the choice this purely a concept question so a is the right choice And sound travels slowest in the air, and sound travels fastest in the steel. Okay, question number twenty-five is done. Question number twenty-six is on your screen. Which list contains an example of a non-magnetic material, a magnetic material, and a magnetized material? non magnetic material for copper for example is non magnetic material magnetic material iron is a magnetic material and a compass needle that is a magnetized material so this is a is the right choice rest we can check copper non magnetic material iron magnetic polythene is not a magnetized material so b cannot be choice iron uh, steel and a compass needle iron is not non magnetic so he wrote iron under non magnetic and the d is also wrong because he wrote iron as non magnetic so only a is the choice question number 26 a is the choice to charge an isolated metal sphere by induction the following four processes are required so the process is very simple you take a uh, you take a metal sphere and on an isolated stand 
insulated fan, sorry, and you bring a charged body near it. So what you do, you bring a charged body near it. So first of all, A should happen. Uh, sorry, first of all, R should happen. And then you earth it. So P should happen. Then you break that earth. That, then um, after P, the Q should happen. And then you remove the charge rod. So then S should happen. So C is the choice. Th this is a famous, uh, how you charge a matter of fear and a famous experiment, you should remember this. 27C is the choice. So we have a metal sphere. First of all, we bring a charge a rod near it. Then we earth uh, one of its uh, sides of the sphere. And then we keep the charge rod uh, in its position. And then we break the, the earth wire. And then we remove that charge rod. The sphere has been charged. So C is the choice. Question number 27, C is the choice. Okay, so on your screen, we have question number 28. And the potential difference across a 10 ohm resistor is five volts. So the potential difference I know across that resistor and I, I also know its resistance. How much charge passes through the 10 ohm resistor in 30 seconds? So when the R value and the V value is given easily, I can find out the I value. Once I know the I value and I know the time, I can find out the charge which is flowing from there. Let me show you my work. I've done this on a paper. So V is equals to I R, I is equals to V divided by R. So it will be five divided by 10. It will be 0 0.5 ampere. So I know the amount of current and then I know the time. I know the current, I can find the charge. So Q will be equals to I multiply T 0 0.5 Ampere multiplied 30 seconds and it will be 15 coulombs. Question number 28. Question number 28, 15 coulomb is the right answer. So 15, so B is the choice. Question number 28, B is the right choice. Question 29, which changes both cause a decrease in the resistance of a copper wire? The resistance of the copper wire can be decreased. The temperature should go lower. That is one fact. The temperature should become lower. So either A or B is the choice. And decrease in the length, yes, that will decrease the resistance. Increase in length, that will increase the resistance. So we are looking for that options where the resistance of the copper wire will decrease. So the length of the copper wire should decrease, then the resistance will also decrease, and the temperature should be lower, then the resistance will be lower. So A is the choice. Question number 29, A is clearly the choice. The diagram shows a circuit. What is the reading on the ammeter when the switch is open and the reading when it is closed? You see, if this switch is open, the switch is open. So this three ohm resistor and three ohm resistor, they will be in series with each other and there will be only one path for the current. So I can find out the value of that current very easily. Uh, the total resistance of the circuit in this case will be six. And the EMF of the cell is also six. The current coming from the battery will be I equals to EMF of the battery divided by the total resistance. So six divided by six, this will be one, uh, one ampere. So the, when the switch is open, both the resistors are connected in series with each other. The current coming from the battery will be one, uh, one ampere, sorry. I said oh, one ampere. Now, when you will close this, when you will close this, what will happen? The current will go through this and goes back. So there is uh, the resistance in the circuit. Now, once you have closed the switch, there will be the resistance of uh, three ohm only. And the EMF is six volts. So I can find out the current coming from the battery and flowing. 
And the current coming from the battery will be EMF divided by the resistance, and that will be six divided by three ohm, and it will be six divided by three will be two. So it looks to me that B will be the choice. I have done this on a paper also. For your understanding, I was I was planning there. <clears throat> Sorry, the question is not here. So directly we are able to give the answer. I think B is the choice. I think you will also be able to do this mentally or orally. Uh, the, when, when the switch is open, then the current flowing through the ammeter will be one ohm, one ampere, sorry. And when the switch is closed, the reading on the ammeter will be 2 ampere. So B is the choice. Question number 30, B is the choice. Question number 31. The diagram shows a circuit. The lamp is 12 watt lamp and is working at normal brightness. What are the readings on the meter? So here we have been given four options. And in each option, the voltmeter reading and the ammeter reading is given. The voltmeter reading is the potential difference. And the ammeter reading is telling you the amount of current. And the power, you know, the formula for the power is equals to IV. Power is equals to IV. So I've done this on a paper. So power is equals to IV. So the 0 0.5 multiplied is that will be 3 watt. The power 2, 0 0.5 into 12, that will be 6 watt. P3, 1 multiplied 12, that will be 12 watt. And P4, 2 multiplied 24, 48 watt. He was, we were looking for that option where the power is 12 watt. So that is the third option. Third option. OK. Question number 31C is the right choice. A lamp rated 6 volt to ampere is switched on for 60 seconds. How much is, how much energy is used? Very sweet. You know the energy, the formula for the electric energy is I multiply V multiply T. The time should be in the seconds, I should be in amperes, and V should be in the volts. IVP. I have done this numerical on my paperwork and let me show you my paperwork. Energy is equals to IVT. So it will be 2 multiplied 6 multiplied 60 and 720 joules is the energy. 720 joules. So let's check what is 720 joules. Do we have that? 720 joules, D is the choice. Question number 32, D is the right choice. The diagram shows three pairs of parallel wires with the current in the direction shown. For each pair of wire, what are the forces between the wires? Also for the parallel wires, very simple. You remember this rule. <clears throat> if the current in both the wires is in the same direction, if the current flowing in both the parallel wires is in the same direction, they will attract each other. If the direction of the current in both the wires who are parallel to each other is opposite to each other, the direction of the current flowing is opposite to each other in the both parallel wires, then they will repel each other. If the direction of the current in both the parallel wires is same, they will attract. If the direction of the current in both the parallel wires is different, so then they will repel each other. So X, they will attract. Y, they will repel. Z, they will attract. Attract, repel, attract. Attract, repel, attract. And I think B is the right option. Question number 33, B looks the right answer to me. And yes, B is the right answer. The coil in an electric motor is wound onto a cylinder. 
why is the cylinder made of soft iron because you see this soft it helps to increase the magnetic field it makes the magnetic field strong to deflect the magnetic field away from the coil no to increase the current through the coil no to increase the strength of the magnetic field through the coil yes this is the purpose of putting that uh, iron iron core to support the coil and prevent it from collapsing no support it yes it do support but it the sole purpose is not that that is for support to increase the strength of the magnetic field through the coil so c is the cho choice question number 34 c is the right choice sir The electromotive force EMF induced in a conductor moving at right angles to a magnetic field does not depend upon. The EMF which is induced in a conductor which is moving at right angle to a magnetic field, the length of the conductor, the resistance, it depends upon the length of the conductor. Okay. The resistance of the conductor, we have never studied this, that it depends upon the resistance of the conductor. The speed of the conductor, obviously the EMF induced depends upon the speed of the conductor. The strength of the magnetic field, it depends upon the strength of the magnetic field. So the B is the right choice that it does not depend upon the resistance of the conductor. We have not studied, read this sentence in our book. 35, B is the right choice on which the magnetic field does not depend. Induced current basically not depend. What is the question? The diagram shows part of an AC generator when its coil is in a horizontal position. The graph, when the, when the coil is in the horizontal position, the, okay, the graph shows the voltage output plotted against the time, which point on the graph shows when the coil is in the vertical. Whenever the coil is in the vertical position, remember this thing, when the coil is rotating and it is horizontal, the EMF induced will be maximum. And when the coil is vertical, when the coil is vertical, the EMF induced will be zero. Whenever the coil becomes vertical, the EMF induced will be zero. So clearly B is the choice. B is the right choice. Question number 36, B is the right choice. When the coil becomes vertical, uh, for a moment, it do not intersect the magnetic lines because that coil is moving parallel to the magnetic lines. And when it do not cut the magnetic lines, the EMF induced in it will be also zero. An alternating voltage of frequency 0 0.5 hertz is supplied to the wire plates of a cathode ray oscilloscope CRO. The diagram shows the screen of the CRO. What is the time taken for the spot? So I know the frequency. So I can find out the time period. One by F, time period is equal to one by F. So to complete one wave, that much time should be taken. And here we have 1.5 wave, one and a half wave. So let me, I've done this on a paper. What is the time taken for, okay. So there are one and a half wave on the whole thing. So on your screen, I hope you can see this, that the time is equal to one by F, one by 0 0.5, 10 divided by five, two seconds. So the time period is two seconds. So from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen, there are 1.5 waves. So one wave will take two seconds, 1.5 waves will take two plus one, three seconds. Three seconds. So the graph will take three seconds because, you know, uh, how do I know three seconds? Because I found out the time period. So for one complete wave, it will take two seconds. And then I have half wave for that, it will take one second. So two plus one, that will be three seconds. So A is the choice. Tritium. Tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen with half-life of 12 minutes. If a sample starts with 40 million atoms of tritium, 
how many atoms of the tritium will be left after 12 years. So because I know that the half-life is 12 years, so he's asking after 12 years, so one half-life will have passed. So if there were 40 million atoms, so after one half-life, they will become half. They will be, how many will be left? Half of them will be left. So 40 million divided by two, it will be 20 million. So how many are left? 40, 20 million. 20 million are left. Let me check, I might have done this. No, I have not done. So B is the choice question number 38. A radioactive nuclei, uranium-92-238, decays into thorium by emitting an alpha particle. The thorium then decays into pro, uh, protactinum by emitting a beta particle. What is the symbol for the protactinum? So we have uranium-92-238. First of all, it emitted an alpha particle and converted into thorium. And then the thorium uh, gave out a beta particle and converted it to protectinum. So let's uh, see, this is asked question is what is the right symbol for the protectinum? Let me show you my work. So try to understand this, how I have done. <clears throat> you see, I have uranium 92 to 38 and it was converted into the thorium and it gave out a alpha particle. When the alpha particle is given out, alpha particle is like the nucleus of helium. It has two protons and four nucleon number. So thorium, which is a daughter nucleus here, its proton number will be two less than the, of the uranium and its mass number will be four less. So the thorium will be 90 to 34. Then the thorium gave out a beta particle and converted into protactinum. And the beta particle, we write minus one and zero. Beta particle, when it takes place, the beta particle of beta decay happen. The daughter nucleus will have one more proton as compared to the parent nucleus. And the mass number will be equal to the parent nucleus. So the mass number of the protectinum will be 234 and the atomic number will be 91. Atomic number will be 91 and 234. Let's check. Do we have that answer here? 91 and 230. D is the choice. D is the choice. 234 and 91. 234 and 91. Yes. Chlorine exists as two isotopes. One has a nucleon number, mass number of 35, and the other has a nucleon number or mass number 37. Which table shows the correct number of protons and neutrons in the isotope? So isotope number one, they both have the, the number of protons because they both are the isotopes of each other. So they should have <clears throat> the same proton numbers. So B is wrong because they have shown different proton numbers. C is totally wrong because they have shown that they have different proton numbers. So B and C are out of the option. A and B, yes, we consider them because the proton number in both isotopes should be same. And the number of uh, neutrons, that is equals to the proton number minus the mass number. So for 35 minus 37. 35 minus 37. So it will be, uh, sorry, uh, first one is 35. So 35 minus 17, by mistake I said 37 minus. 35 minus 17. 35 minus 17, and you get the neutrons for the isotope number one. And for the second, uh, you will do 37 minus 17. So let me check. Let me bring the, what we want is the calculator. Okay, so let me do this. So the first one is 35, its mass number is 35, and its proton number is 17. 
So 18, yes, the number of protons are correctly shown in the first option. The second one is 37 minus 17, 20. So A is the right option. They are correct numbers. In the D, I don't know whether they have shown it correctly or not, but uh, A is the right answer. Question number 40 is the right answer. Isotopes will have the same number of protons. Their, new, their number of neutrons you can find easily by subtracting their mass number uh, uh, minus the proton number. The rest will be the number of neutrons. So A is the choice question number 40. So my dear students, by this question, I have reached the end of this paper. And you can see that today we have done May, June 2000, and we have done May, June 2011 <clears throat> paper. Uh, the subject we were studying physics and school level physics, physics 5054, we call it. Today we have done paper 1 1. This paper is an MCQ paper, and we call it paper 1. And that paper we have taken from the from the variant one. So um, I think that enough for today. So we thank you very much, everybody. And I want to make a request that if this video is helpful to you, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel. And uh, don't forget to, uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and uh, don't forget to, Tell your friends about this video. So thank you very much. Have a good day. God bless you all. So...